know I really used to care how I look in these videos, but now... Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do a definitive ranking of almost every book I read this year. It's just purely based on my gut feeling. This is just a really pointless video and just basically lets me talk about the books I've read, even though I've already talked about a lot of these, because that's sort of all this channel is, and then sometimes I ruin my hair. Okay, okay. So let's start with uh, the worst book, which is number 47. And just because I'm an English major and I feel like I need to like defend myself a little bit, because I still have it in my head that I need to read a lot of books constantly, and I just feel like it used to be all about like getting to 100 books and 50 books and all that. I did read a little bit more than this for school, because I, in case I don't say it often enough, I do study English Lit, but I did also do a lot of poetry and stuff this term, so I haven't read that much more than this. I don't know, I kind of had an ethical dilemma because I wasn't sure if I should put into the title, like, ranking all the books I read, 50 books, because I feel like it really isn't about the number, but just like, you know? So the worst book I think I've read this year, if it even counts as having read it because I didn't really read it or finish it was Kingdom of Ash. I made a whole series about me rereading Throne of Glass and trying to make sense of what that series actually just is. Um, mm, um, but yeah, I think out of all of the books I read this year, the one I would least rather return to or read or think about is Kingdom of Ash. I just think it's completely unreadable. Hence why I couldn't read it. Number 46, I have Empire of Storms because I think I did reread it in full. I don't even remember. It's been a while. But yeah, I have a whole video about it and it was just a complete fever dream start to finish. Like it was the first time I read it. Sarah J Mass owes me money. Like you're going to jail for stealing my money and my time the way that woman has. Number 45 is The Prelude, like the 1805 version by Wordsworth, which I technically also didn't completely finish, but I'm gonna make a video that's at least partly about that soon, I think. But yeah, also unreadable, but it has its moments. And number 44, uh, the only reason I got Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte was because I got it at a secondhand store for like a couple bucks. And I was like, oh, I really don't like uh, Jane Eyre, and I really don't like Wuthering Heights. Maybe this Bronte sister will hit different, and she did not. It was just so boring. And I think this is sort of the thing about basically getting all of my books from like secondhand stores, is that I, if I see a recognizable author, I will usually buy the book because I'm a stupid English nerd and I'm like, oh yes, I must read Thomas Hardy. Ugh. Or like, I must read Anne Bronte. But I didn't get The Tenant of Wild Fell Hall or whatever, which I do actually have now, which is her most popular one. I got Agnes Grey, which is probably the weirdest one, and it's all about, like, it's not about her, but it's basically about her because she used to be a governess and she writes about being a governess. And, um, I mean, there's some bits highlighted in here. Um, oh. Mm -mm. I honestly don't remember anything other than the kids were really annoying. That she teaches um so yeah glad i read it but like it just is very blah number 43 is uh, oedipus rex or oedipus the king which like the best thing about that was that it was short like i just am really not a drama person and i got through alice in wonderland that was all right it's like 100 pages but then i got to through the looking glass and like i stopped like right around here i just mm. I don't know. But the nonsensical stuff really isn't my thing, even though I see why this was so popular. And I think especially back in the day, this would have hit really hard and it just didn't hit me hard. Um, and then number 41, which is actually a reread, is Anna and the French Kiss. Um, it, well, it definitely did not hold up in the reread and it did not hold up the first time I read it. It was just very addicting. And then the second time, it was interesting because I also made a video about this, which I'll get to later. But it's a, it's at least readable. It's terrible, but it is very readable. And I would much rather reread Anna and the French Kiss than Alice in Wonderland, Oedipus Rex, Agnes Grey, The Prelude, or the second two, uh, last two Throne of Glass books. So I don't know what that says about me. Number 40 is uh, Lady Midnight 3, which... Take a shot every time I say I made a video about it, but I did make a video about it and I don't remember that either. 
Maybe the problem is me, not these books. And then number 39 is Queen of Shadows. And then 38 is Air Fire. Because they're just fine. I definitely am never going to read those two books again. But like, it was at least slightly readable. And then number 37, which is kind of a surprise. I didn't think this book would be this low. But it's uh, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, which I have mentioned before. And it was just fine. But I am never going to reread this. But it was fun while it lasted. Kind of wish I had just gotten a PDF of this. Like, I don't know why I own it. It doesn't do much for me. Far from the matting crowd? Is that right? Oh yeah, I read that in February. Oh. Again, not that memorable. And I have a thing against books that are all about fields. It's, it's very rural, very British. But I, I already own another Hardy. I'm definitely gonna read it. Like some of the writing in here is very nice. Like I have more stuff highlighted. Number 35 is Utopia by Thomas More, which was interesting. Number 34 is Diviner. Well, I did finish, I did read this one completely. And then the other three I sort of skim read because like I, I didn't have to buy them. And I, I think I've said it before, this had a lot of potential. But then it just got so boring and convoluted and like, ugh. And then number 33 is Romance of the Forest by Anne Radcliffe, which I read because I read Northanger Abbey and she is inspired by Anne Radcliffe. I think she mentions her, I think maybe Jane Austen wrote about reading about her. This was another one of those books I found for very cheap at a secondhand store, recognized the author and was like, I'll read this even though it's not their most important or famous work. And I think you can tell that this was just fine. <laughs> um, it had some good words in it. I think genre-wise this was really interesting. I appreciate that I've read it and I feel like I could laugh about it a little bit because it's quite melodramatic. But then towards the end it dragged a bit and I definitely skipped about 20 pages or so. But yeah, glad I read it. Wouldn't reread it. And number 32 is another book I reread, which is... I do this every time. Great. Heartless by Marissa Meyer, which I remember really liking at the time when I read it, when I was like 14, 15 maybe? When did this come out? Yeah, I think as far as YA goes, this was at least interesting and very unique and it was definitely fun. I really read it during quarantine and I think it was just a good way to stay entertained and I just noticed that if I'm reading a book that I don't have to think about reading that's purely for entertainment then I don't go on my phone as much and I think it is better for me. Number 31 is Crown of Midnight and then number 30 is Throne of Glass and I feel like they all kind of go in pairs because it's like every couple of books it was just like you were reading a completely new series and I think this is very reflective of that. And I genuinely found myself enjoying Throne of Glass 1 and 2. I would honestly reread those in a couple of years when I've forgotten kind of what happens again. Just for like pure entertainment and nostalgia. Yeah, it's kind of a good time, weirdly. The number 29 is... Um... Oh also, I didn't get out any of the Throne of Glass books because you've seen way too much of those on this channel already this year and I honestly apologize for it. Number 29 is Green River Running Red by Anne Rule, which is my least favorite Anne Rule book and I think it's purely because the story, I don't think it makes for a good true crime book because I think usually when I read or watch something about true crime, I feel like there's always something I'm learning about a certain group of people or a certain moment in time or an area or the justice system, something like that. But with this book, there he was like one of the most prolific serial killers in the sense that I think he just killed the most women over a span of like 20 years. And obviously all true crime has harrowing, meaningless death and just a complete waste of human life that occurs and it's really tragic. But with this, it was so much. I think Anne Rule is really good about paying attention to the victims rather than the people who have killed. And to place emphasis on how every single one of them was an individual. But when there's this sheer quantity, it's just more difficult to do that. And I, I don't know. I don't know. It's really difficult to talk about these things. But yeah, if you want to read some Anne Rule's true crime, I would not recommend to this one. Some of the police investigation stuff was quite interesting just because it did take them so long to find him. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard. 
Le okay, let's leave it up there. And number 28 is Flush. It's the biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Pet Spaniel. And, um... Again, I, I just, I don't know why I make videos about books when I don't remember anything I read. It's really bad. But yeah, I just thought it was fine, but nothing sticks out to me in hindsight. Number 27 is considered The Lobster by David Foster Wallace, who's one of my new friends' favorite authors, and I wanted to read something by him. And it's a collection of essays, and the first one is about porn, which sounds kind of like, it's about this like porn convention. He chooses like weird topics, but he writes about them well, and he's kind of funny. But then towards the end, there's this one short story where if, if you've read this, you know exactly which one it is. It's, I'm, if I'm gonna try to insert a picture of it or something. It's not like one stream of thought that he's following, it's like 50 at once. And my friend I think really digs that and that's kind of how his brain is, but I, me with my tiny little brain, we simply cannot and do not. And then number 25 and 26, and I don't know which one's above the other, doesn't really matter, is Six of Crows and Crooked, Kingdom, Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, which I also reread in quarantine. And honestly, yeah, they really held up. They were very entertaining, still well-written. I still like the characters. I feel so far removed from wanting to read young adult fantasy again. But these two were really just worth it. They were a good time. And I will keep these, I think, forever, because I do like the idea of if I ever have a child, which I don't think I will, but I'm pretty sure my brother will, being able to like pass down my books and be like, I read this as a child. <laughs> read these, maybe not a child when you're old enough to handle death. Number 23, which I also did not finish fully, but I think I read most of the books, was The Metamorphosis by Ovid, which I thought I would hate because all of the old, like, classical stuff I just am bored by and I can appreciate it, but I'm like, eh. But he has, he, Ovid, it's different. I quite liked Ovid, and if you're gonna read something weird and old like that, just to be pretentious, I would recommend that it be the metamorphosis. Number 22 is uh, Lady Susan, which uh, is an epistolary novel by Jane Austen, and this was definitely weighing on my conscience because I was always like, oh, I've read all of Austen, but I hadn't read this yet. And I feel like you do need to read this to, you know, go around saying you've read all of Austen. Um, and I think it was very entertaining for an afternoon, because it is so short. But again, it doesn't stick out in my mind. You're not missing out on much if you haven't read Lady Susan. And then number 21 is definitely a bit of a weird one and not what I would normally read, but it was dead funny. And it was about humor and comedy in the Third Reich, which I thought was a really interesting angle to take on a period of time that's obviously been written about so much that I, like I covered it for my final exams at school. I did. I would like to think I knew, you know, already a bit about it. But this definitely showed a whole nother side and I find cultural history, I guess, really interesting in that way because it helps you to remember that history was a thing that happened to real people. I used to read quite a bit of nonfiction and then I just, I don't know, my brain has just shrunk, I think I've realized. Number 20 is The Voyage Out, which is Virginia Woolf's first book. And I don't think I want to say too much about the Virginia Woolf books in this because once I read between the acts, if I reread Mrs. Dalloway, I think I will make a video of me ranking all of Wolf. But that is in not the near future. And I think it was fine. <laughs> like, it, it was Wolf, so obviously it was really good. I love her to death, but obviously it wasn't her best. But it is really interesting to see sort of the things she developed throughout her entire life as an author. Like, if you read all of the work by an author, I feel like it just hits different to see sort of where they started and where they ended up. But yeah, if you're looking to read Wolf, this is not the place to start. Then number 19 is uh, Jacob's Room, which I th I did enjoy more. And as you can see, I have some of my favorite moments marked here. Lots of good words in it, as usual, with Wolf, but definitely not her standout work. And then number 18, The Years, which I'm s I just, these editions of books are so pretty. I mm. Again, really solid, really interesting, lots of good phrases, lots of good moments. Definitely sowing a lot of the seeds that she'll pick up on in later works. Number 16, Small Sacrifices, which I think this the reason this one was more successful was because it was very much about the lives of the victims before and after. And it was very much about kind of like the way you piece together what has happened in a court case. And yeah, it was really fucked up. 
as they always are. And then number 16, it has to be The Stranger Beside Me. This is the best Anne Rule book because she writes about Ted Bundy and she knew Ted Bundy while he was killing women and obviously no one else knew he was killing women and talked to her from prison and when he was out and this is a really insane story. And if you're into true crime at all, even if you already know a lot about this case, I think this one is still worth reading, even though I hate giving Bundy attention because like I always say, he would have really gotten off on that. The way that the court case basically went down and the way his case was handled because of how he was like a, you know, handsome, white lawyer and everyone thought he was going to do really well and all that. Like the privilege that plays into it and then his intelligence, which I have to admit reluctantly, and then also just like the death penalty stuff and it, 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 I think it's very interesting and I think there is a lot to be learned from this book in a lot of different ways. Number 15 is The Middle on the Floss by George Eliot and the first hundred pages of this I absolutely hated. It was so boring. But then after that, there were like 200 pages where I was like, oh, this is, you know, all right for like a book with like England and fields. And then the last 100 pages. Okay, the middle on the floss. <laughs> then there were 200 pages that were like pretty interesting. I was vibing. And then the last 100 pages really got me. I was really interested. Um, and yeah, things just got surprisingly spicy. I didn't think they would, but I think it's... Mm, yes. Number 14 is The Little Friend by Donna Tartt, which was the first hundred pages. I thought this would be just as good as The Secret History, but it kind of wasn't. Like it, mm, I don't know. Mm, I don't know if I am confident enough to say it, but it does feel very Donna Tartt. And I feel like what's so interesting about this is that it kind of eschews genre in the sense that on the surface level, it's about a death or like, it's not like a detective story, obviously, or like a mystery, but the book centers around finding the person who murdered Robin and like he's dead on the first page. So that's not a spoiler. So it was definitely a really sort of unique concept or at least I haven't read anything like this, but it kind of goes off on so many things that it, I don't think it has a very clear sense of direction. This felt very slice of life and I enjoyed it and I'm happy that I read it. But I don't think this is my favorite Donna Tartt and I don't know if I would recommend this to a friend. Number 13 is Bridget Jones. And I've mentioned before that I read this book at the perfect time. I was like sad about a boy and it was really stupid and it was January, I think. And I was just in a bit of a like slump, just in a lot of different ways. And I do think that this book is very funny and very well written and I love the movies. And um, yeah, this is something I think I'm gonna keep forever because it is very re-readable. So if you haven't read this yet, I think you definitely should. Number 12, another weird one, sort of, is The Post Office Girl. And I don't think the translation is great, but I have a very special attachment to this book. And I think I haven't read a lot of sort of books that explicitly deal with the post-war period. It purely focuses on the personal and emotional impact of the First World War, but it's from the perspective of a woman who has obviously stayed at home. She wasn't on the front lines, but just how the war has completely destroyed any semblance she can have of living a real life. And then she kind of has a taste of what, you know, life might have been like if it hadn't been destroyed by sort of the socio-economic political circumstances of the period. And it's just, yeah, it's a lot, but I like it and I've read it multiple times. Number 11. Again, I've talked Jane Austen to death on this channel, but it's Sense and Sensibility, which is not my favorite Austen, but is a really good book still because it is an Austen. And I can see myself rereading this sort of soon, to be honest. Number 10 is Women in Love by D.H. Lawrence. And this is another one of those books I read because I got it at a secondhand bookstore and I knew I wanted to read some D.H. Lawrence at some point. But Women in Love, at least my friend said this, was like, oh, isn't it known to be his worst book or something like that? And I definitely kind of hated it when I was reading it just because it is really long. It doesn't look it, but this is 500 pages and it's just really weird. Like the scene that sticks out to me the most was like them dancing naked in caves, I think, something like that. And I'm really intrigued and I got Sons and Lovers at another secondhand bookstore, but I got lucky and I didn't get the weird one. I got the famous one, finally. So yeah, I'm interested now. This at least was a really weird, different kind of book. Number nine, 
Northanger Abbey, easy, fun, Austen at one of her best. Really love this book. And this paired with um, The Romance of the Forest. Number eight, Night and Day. Okay, I don't usually buy books off Amazon, but sometimes I simply cannot find second hand copies of the books I want to read. And then they do have quite a bit of good second hand stuff. And this was the first time I ordered a book that was, um, instead of being in like, what is it, like really good condition, this was just in good condition. And it came and the first thing that hit me was like the weird smell. And like it's not moldy or anything, but it's definitely been damp at some point. But yeah, it was kind of good because I ended up ripping out some pages from this, like my favorite, and putting them up on the wall. And yeah, it cost like, not even like two bucks. I think this was a lot more interesting than The Voyage Out. And again, love Wolf. Lots of really good moments in this. Really enjoyed it. Really love the descriptions of London. Just I'm a bitch for this <laughs> author. What can I say? And then number seven, already mentioned it. The Secret History, which I already read ages ago. But yeah, I, it weirdly, it held up. I didn't, I wasn't sure whether it would, but I still enjoyed it the first time, kind of knowing the twist or whatever. And I just have a really big thing for dark academia. And even the way I dress now, not like this, this is not even mine. Like when I'm not in my PJs, the way I dress is very much me trying to channel the secret history. And I kind of want to read more dar dark academia because it's made out to be such a thing on like, Tumblr or whatever, but I couldn't name another dark academia book I don't even know if it's a real genre, but maybe that's something I should kind of delve into at some point. I think I would really like it. Number six, another weird one, is uh, Virginity and Young Adult Fiction After Twilight by Christine Seifert. I have a whole nother video about that whole experience of reading that and Anna and the French Kiss, but I just haven't had a book change my mind and like have, you know, that kind of like moment where just everything you've been living is a lie. And I really loved it. and. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's just so good. Number five is Penin by Vladimir Nabokov. And Lolita was my favorite book I read last year. And I haven't read anything else by him since then. And then I finally picked up Penin. I just was in a bookstore and I saw it and I knew I wanted to read Nabokov. And he's so popular that it's really difficult to find him in secondhand bookstores. So dare I say it, I bought it new. No, I'm ashamed as well, but it was worth the full price. He's just so funny in his sad, weird, messed up way. And Panin is all about this uh, Russian professor sort of living his life at an American university. And I just cannot describe how much I love Nabokov. And I think the next, like, I want to read all of his books. That's sort of my next goal. I just, I'm very obsessed with him. And he has potential to be like up there with Virginia Woolf once I kind of have read more of him and feel very solid and sane. I like all of his work. Number four, and this honestly could have been first because of how much I loved this book and I don't think I've mentioned it, but I read Rebecca and this, you need to read it. It doesn't matter what kind of genre you're into, what kind of books you like to read, read Rebecca because it is so atmospheric and weird and messed up but entertaining and just i love it i really love it i'm so obsessed with it i want to reread it i want everyone i know to read it and i cannot thank my friend enough for recommending it to me and her and i have really bonded over it and we're gonna watch the netflix movie together because we're so worried that that movie is gonna be bad and ruin kind of like the vision we have of this book in our head that we need to watch it together so we can kind of just like make jokes about it while it's happening so as not to give it too much power, you know, if it's bad. Number three, The Waves by Virginia Woolf. And this is barely even a book. This I think is just a really long poem and I don't normally love poetry that much, but wowee, I love that book and I really want to study it. I really, really, it's so, mm, not the place to start with Wolf. It's definitely very out there. I think it's her most experimental work, but I, I want, I, I just, I love when I read a book and it makes me feel dumb because I just can't figure out what's happening anymore. And that's exactly what this book did. I'll talk more about this someday. And then number two, and like all of these kind of top five, top four books could have been number one easily. It's kind of like an arbitrary arrangement as all of these have been. And that is Orlando. And this is like a fake autobiography about Orlando morphing from a man in the 1600s to a woman in the 20th century. And it's just, the amount of things I highlighted in this book, I just, I could barely keep up. It's so beautifully written. It's so funny. It's so wolf. 
yeah, very rereadable, as is The Waves. Definitely want to reread both of those. Not sure when, but I will do. Like, I just feel like I'm going to be 70 years old rereading Wolf's books. And I still am going to get a lot out of them. And then number one, I don't know, kind of controversial, but like only with myself. Like, no one else is arguing against this. But I chose A Handful of Dust by Evelyn... That. Oh, you can't read. Evelyn... Wah? Whoa? Evelyn Wah is the correct response. Okay, Evelyn Wah. He's a guy, so I guess it's not Evelyn. But I was at the bookstore buying Panin, and then I was, you know, already in a mood to waste all of my money on new books. And I just, I saw the Penguin Classics Edition, and you know, usually if it's a classic, I feel like it should be a name I recognize, and I had not recognized or heard Evelyn Wah ever before. So I just pulled this off the shelf, like out of curiosity. And then, apparently, it's one of the 20th century's most chilling and bitter novels, and one of its best. And just the blurb got me. I mumbled so much, I'm just gonna give you a bad voiceover now. After seven years of marriage, the beautiful Lady Brenda Lost is bored with life at Hetton Abbey at the Gothic Mansion that is the pride and joy of her husband, Tony. She drifts into an affair. And that is all I needed to read, because like I said, I had kind of a Gothic moment with Northanger Abbey and the Romans of the Forest. And then I had a moment with like mansions as well with uh, Rebecca. And I don't know, it just, it, it intrigued me. I like the cover. So I was like, I haven't done this for ages, where I have just bought like a random book by a random person knowing nothing about it. And I am, I was so obsessed with it. I read it so quickly and it's, it, I just love funny books, but like it's sort of Nabokov funny in the way that it's really twisted and messed up and kind of like satirical. Towards the end, it kind of goes off a bit and I definitely like the beginning more. And I'm currently actually reading Vile Bodies, which is his most famous book, which I am enjoying as well. Not as much as A Handful of Dust, but I think this one is even funnier. And it's basically just about satire about sort of London society after the First World War and kind of the new generation that comes out of that and how shallow they are. Like Stephen Fry called it Britain's Great Gatsby. And I love the cover, I love the title. Love the book, and I think he's written a couple more other books, but not that many, and I definitely want to read all of his books. He deserves to have number one just because he surprised me so much. I didn't think I would like him as much as I did. Definitely love Evil and Wah, even if I think his name is kind of silly. And also, please look at the picture of him at the back. Like... I just wish he were a bit more self-aware with that pipe. Yeah, I read. I did read. 